So very good morning to you all. Uh, as you know that the last week we did monetary policy and this week we will focus on the fiscal policy. And after fiscal policy, we'll spend some time together about the, um, the questioning. If you have any questions to ask me or if you have anything to share with me, or if you want that, or if you think that I explained this term or phrase, but maybe you haven't understood, or maybe I haven't enough elaborated it, so we can go about it as many times we can. And by the way, uh, there's one um, offer for you. Uh, as I said that the last week, uh, the next week would be next week and the week following and the week following uh, is basically your show. Uh, but just in case you want me to have in-person meeting with you, uh, even after today, you still have the problem, then it's very natural that you will have the discussion, you have the confusions, which is a positive problem in a way. Uh, let me know, I can organize a special uh, in-person classroom session with you, where you can come again. Uh, we can find some mutually convenient time and you guys can come here or on Zoom and I can try to answer your queries, okay? So if the need be, but there's no supply without demand, okay? So if there's a genuine demand for such thing, please let us know in the discussion forum, okay? So, I mean, after today, it doesn't mean that I, I will not <laughs> take care of you. So if you have the need, if there is a requirement, uh, I can organize a, another remedial session Fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is the policy in which the state is very active in the economy. The state is not only uh, indulging itself in the political affairs, forming the government, running the, you know, the, the state departments, but at the same time, the state is also interested in the economic aspects of life. The state have its finances. Finance, the money comes in. State gets money from the taxes, the fees which we pay. Uh, just before I was telling you uh, that in many countries you need to, if you want to have a uh, TV at home, you need to pay the fee. The fee goes to the state. You, you buy a new car, uh, it's very expensive, uh, but that's not the only money you spend, you also have to uh, buy the, you have to pay the road tax, for example, which goes to the state. So there are fees, fines, penalties uh, on top of taxes that we pay. That is the public finance. We use the word government finance, but because the government, government is a people public. So whenever uh, we fix this phrase, uh, prefix public, it basically referring to something about state. So the public finance means uh, how and, and in what way the state is getting its money. And then uh, the state takes that money in the form of taxes and then it spends. Spends on what? Spends on roads. Spends on the the public facilities, the common facilities, health, public housing, uh, transportation, safety, uh, law and order, education. So all those spendings are called public spendings. Pension, by the way, uh, uh, you know, the social security in, the, in, for example, in, the, in many countries, the concept of social security is very much very prolific, very profound, very strong, okay? So all these things, uh, when the state is uh, gets the revenue and then the state is also spending all these activities which are comparable with the businesses, that's what businesses do, isn't it? They are spending on the production of goods and services, then they sell them and then they get the revenue. But there's a difference between uh, the private businesses and the public businesses uh, is that there is a difference in the approach and the mindset. One of the foremost purpose of the private enterprises is 
profit maximization. Okay. On the contrary, the profit maximization cannot be the principle or the sole motive objective of the public enterprises. It is welfare. It is, you know, uh, giving something, increasing the living standards of people in the society. Do you get my point? Yeah. Fiscal policy refers to the use of the government spendings, developmental and the non-developmental. Developmental is, again, we make this kind of categories uh, of spending. Let's say uh, uh, the state, the, the local council of Uvascula, they start constructing a road or repairing a road. The road length uh, is increased. The road width is increased. The quality of road is increased. Maybe the number of lanes are increased. The marking is done properly. Lighting has been repaired. This is called developmental spending. But when I'm giving this example of uh, repairing the street lights, constructing a new road, repairing the existing road, improving the marking of the lane, am I forgetting something in this activity? Well, there are people who are working, the workers, the labor. Mm -hmm. I pay them what wages, of course. That is called non-developmental expenditure. Because that, as a, as a user of the road, I don't care about the wages that the workers are, paying, are getting. But I'm interested in whether the lights are functional or the road is fine. That is for me, that is developmental, right? Uh, even though this word non-developmental sounds very rudish, because after all, when you pay the wages, uh, the families develop, their living standards improve, and there is a recovery cycle in the economy. But in the technical jargons, we categorize the government spending into developmental spending and the non-governmental spending. Oh, sorry, non-developmental spending, developmental and non-developmental. Make sense? So the first component of the fiscal policy is the state spending, the public. Look, there are many names, so don't get confused. State slash government slash public. These three words would be used as synonyms uh, in the jargons of economics, okay? Taxation is the second part. In the first, the spending, uh, the money goes out from the state's pockets. But where does money come from in the state's pocket? A major source is taxation. Mm -hmm. What is a tax? If you have to define tax in a very simple language, what would you call a tax? Tax, tax is something what? What is tax? Tax is, yes. Tax is a, a charge. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but should I call it a charge? I have to know what is meant by the charge. What, what, can, can you help me? What, what do you mean by the charge? Charging somebody, you know, police charging, these kind of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the, the, the expression charge, uh, I think I would rather use the word charge if you are supposed to pay a tax and you don't pay, and then I send you notice, hey, you are a defaulter, you haven't paid, so I charge you. But I, I would say that, uh, yes, please go ahead first. The way to distribute 
wealth and money mm -hmm. only, uh, inside one distribute or redistribute oh <laughs> i don't know because when they have yeah really redistribute. redistribute yeah uh, now i'm slightly off track the word i'm i'm again the the, the series i was talking about mind your language thing you know so now I'm lost in words again. Uh, first of all, tax is a mandatory payment. It's a compulsory payment. It's an uh, involuntary payment. Nobody pays tax voluntarily, hmm? unless you are very, how to say, very, what's a phrase, what do you call that? Uh, some kind of very social, we have a very strong passion to serve the humanity or the mankind. Uh, everybody pays tax involuntary involuntarily uh, it's a mandatory it's compulsory thing if you are supposed to pay you have to pay but very important thing is that uh, that the lady has mentioned that it's about redistribution when the distribution starts and how the distribution start we work as we contribute as labor you know the land labor Capital and the enterprise are the four factors who contribute to the economy, who produce goods and services. Land gets rent, labor gets wages, uh, capital gets interest, enterprise gets profits if they are good enough, otherwise they have losses. And then what happened is that when this first phase of distribution is done, it could be possible that some factors get more than the others, substantially more than the others. That can create uh, inequalities in the society, which are not very positive thing, yeah? It's not a very good thing to happen. To bring the balance, the state comes and it uses the instrument of taxation uh, to bring the equity in the, I won't say equality, equity. Again, we are caught in the words, what is equity and what is equality? So I'll explain it again. Uh, to make it, to make the society as equitable as possible so that the people, those who can have, those who can pay more, they should pay more taxes and those who cannot pay taxes, they shouldn't pay taxes, Rather, the, the tax which the state has collected from rich people, it should be spent on the welfare of the uh, people who are having lesser resources. So some people have surplus resources, some have the deficient resources. State comes as a fine tuner, as a moderator. It takes money in the form of taxes from people who have surpluses. And then it starts channelizing towards those who are deficient. And thus, there is some sort of equity is restored or the state should restore this equity. Equality and equity is not the same thing. Equality is that Everybody gets something equal. Equity is that everybody gets according to their needs, what they are required. If the state says that we would start giving thousand euros per month to every family, it can be equality, but some families are bigger, some are smaller. And then the state adjusts this amount according to the number of people in the family. Number one, number two, some families could be very healthy. Some could be, most people are sick. You know, they are physically challenged. Uh, some people who live in uh, a town where the living standards are low, whereas some people are living in the big cities where the living standards are high, rather expensive. So the state is also adjusting this amount. Mm -hmm. Do you get my point? I remember a, a, a kind of a 
a graphic I saw, and that graphic was showing the difference between equity and equality. And there were two pictures in it. There's a big wall. You need to see across the wall. This example is very important. And all the people who are this side of the wall are not tall enough to see through the wall, see across the wall. So they need some place to stand on so that they can see across the wall. Do you get my point? There's a big wall. Imagine there's a big wall here and we all are standing here and we want to see across the wall. And then the equality is that everybody gets the same size of a chair or a stool where you can stand on so that you can see across the wall. Maybe those who are tall, they would be able to see across the wall. But those who are not very tall, they will not be able to see. And then the state gives them, or somebody gives them different heights of stool. Do you get my point? So the short people gets big stool, the big table or a big chair so that they can stay taller. And those who are tall enough, they get the small size of the uh, chair or a support uh, because they can see even with the lower height of aid across the wall. The second example is equity. So the state use fiscal policy as a tool to promote equity. Did I use some other words? I said that I'll come back to this word again. Oh. Taxation can be direct and indirect. I remember we had discussion about it uh, some time ago. Uh, direct and indirect taxation. The direct tax is if I, the state, want to tax you and the tax burden falls on you, you pay tax, but you cannot, you cannot recover the amount from somebody else. So my intention is to tax you and I get tax from you and you are not able to shift the tax on somebody else. There's no element of shiftability. This is called direct tax. Examples. Income tax, the individuals pay. Uh, the companies pay corporate tax. They, they can't shift to anybody else. Uh, there is a, another tax called gift tax. You know, when the uh, gift tax, or we also sometimes something similar is called inheritance tax. Have you heard about the inheritance tax? That when the property, the, the, what you uh, inherit from your uh, parents, uh, when they are transferring officially to you, they have to pay tax to the state. Mm -hmm. Inheritance tax, which is quite a big amount, I would say, because every time the property, you know, the generational thing, uh, you have to go through the process and that is not free. It costs, it's called inheritance tax. Something is called gift tax also. When you are gifting something, then the person who is making a gift has to pay tax to the state. Okay. And even there is a death tax. So tax, we pay tax even when we die. Uh, so there is a death tax you pay. I mean, we, you don't know you pay, but somebody pays on your behalf when people die and we use all those you know, services. Anyway, that's a very sad thing to discuss. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is that that there is no element of shiftability in the tax. So these are the examples of direct taxes. But we also have a second category of tax called indirect taxes. Indirect taxes are very interesting. There is an element of shiftability. The tax is intended on you but you are very clever. You know what you do? You pass tax to your, on the burden on, on the shoulder of your friend and then it goes on. Example, 
when we buy something from the store, there is a sales tax. But the seller, the shops, the stores, they recover this tax from the consumer by charging more price. You import something, you pay the custom duty. Yeah. You pay excise duty. If you are moving things within the country from one part to another part, you pay some tax. So those taxes, which are shiftable, they are called indirect taxes. Yeah. If a tax is shiftable, yeah. If if uh, I I impose tax on you and you are able to recover this tax from somebody else, uh, then it's called indirect taxes. There's a shiftability, so you can shift it. Mm. Shiftability means you can shift the burden. The burden is the tax burden is shiftable. Okay, if I'm a big company, Nokia. I pay 40% of my uh, profit, 45%, maybe 50% or even more, uh, part of my profit as a tax, you know? I can't recover it from anybody. But if I'm Nokia and I'm selling phone and I'm, I am buying some semiconductors from South Korea, okay? When I bring them to Finland, I pay custom duty. It's a cost. But this cost I add in the price and recover from my consumer. So there is a element of shiftability in one case, but there's no element of shiftability in the other case. Uh, the third part of fiscal policy is called public borrowings. The state is a very big borrower, I hope you know. The countries borrow. Countries borrow from people within the country. If it is within the country, it's called internal borrowing hmm? and how does the state borrow remember the monetary policy we discussed that the state issues some securities to you you buy them the money goes to from people to the state this way the state can borrow from people the borrowings can be short term the borrowings can be long term if the state borrows uh, if the borrowing period is less than 365 days, it's called short-term borrowing. Uh, but if the borrowing period is 365 days and above, it's a long-term borrow. State, believe me, is a very big borrower. I, I, I wish the website which I would show you, you should explore it and you will see that how big borrower the state can be. The states can borrow even for 30, 40, 50 years not from the people, but from the organizations, right? But anyways, I come back to it. The state can also borrow internally from its people, but state can also borrow externally from other countries. The external borrowing can further be bilateral and multi or multilateral. Can you see these words here? Bilateral or multilateral. If a small country in Africa is borrowing from the USA, so it's between state and a state, it's called bilateral borrowing. Bilateral borrowing. Because it's between, bi means two, yeah? That's how we understand bicycle. Like, uh, multilateral means when you are borrowing from a group of countries. Multilateral, many countries. When you borrow from, when a country borrow from IMF or World Bank or uh, European Central Bank or Asian Development Bank or International Financial Corporation, then it is called multilateral borrowing. Why we call it multilateral borrowing? Because these all these organizations which I mentioned, IMF, World Bank, uh, 
Uh, they belong to many countries. They are like global uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, many countries borrow from World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, we borrow from World Bank. We borrow from IMF. Have you heard IMF? International Monetary Fund? Yeah. Uh, do you know the difference between the two? Uh, if, for example, a country, let's say Bangladesh, it borrow from World Bank and then it borrow from IMF, what does it mean? Look, very important. If you want to have a liberal loan, soft loan, more like a help kind of, it's a lo loan, but very liberal, very, very easy loan, then the, you usually approach the World Bank. Mm -hmm. that's, that's more like a generous helping, accommodating. But if you want to have more like a commercial loan, you know, typical borrowing and lending, you pay interest and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, like we borrow from, like we borrow, I mean, how to say, the usual uh, typical borrowing and lending relationship, then I think IMF is a much better suited organization. More on the commercial scale, more on the commercial uh, relationship, uh, with the World Bank, the relationship is more accommodating, more helping, more like a soft uh, borrowing. And by the way, the World Bank is not the official name. Uh, the actual name of World Bank is International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It's called IDRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development but we call as a nickname or popularly as like a World Bank. So, like we all have nicknames. So World Bank is more like a nickname, informal expression. Uh, and then another component of fiscal policy is a balancing figure. I, I think I can, I can explain it with example uh, with some uh, with a whiteboard. Let's say we have taxation and the total tax the state has collected is 1,000 out of which direct is uh, direct is uh, 300 oh. 300 and indirect is 700. The state has borrowed some money as well. And let's say the state has borrowed 2000, uh, no, maybe, maybe 600. And let's say that out of which the internal borrowing uh, is 200 and the external borrowing is 400. May I ask you how much money state has now? How much money state has? Huh? How much money state is having? Excellent. 1,600. Because taxes, the money comes to state, borrowing, even though it's a borrowing, uh, money comes to state. And then where does money go to? What is it called? Well, redistribution is a philosophical term, conceptual term, <laughs> but at the operational level, what do we call it? Public expenditure on roads, buildings, hospitals, education, safety, social security, law and order. Mm -hmm. And let's say, uh, the public expenditure I can make a different color if possible so that they don't mix up. Um, let's call it. Oh no, 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 no. What, what I'm doing. Anyways, um, and let's say that the public expenditure is two thousand. Now, what happens? Just look at your example. You're 
Your total money in your cash, uh, in your pocket is 1,600 and you are spending 2,000. What would happen? What, what word do you use then? Deficit. So then the state is having a deficit. Deficit of what? 400. Total, uh, yeah, make sense? How do you cover this deficit? If you are the finance minister of Finland or any country for that matter, how would you cover it up? Would you let it go? Would you let the imbalance go? Do we do, do like this? Huh? We borrow more, yeah. We tax more, yeah. Very good. What else we do then? Yeah. Uh, cut expenses, yes. Uh, what we call as a austerity plans, you know. What else we can do? We can do something else also. You know what? The state has a printing press and the state has lots of paper, paper and press. What would you do with the paper and press? You know the printing press here, yeah? which prints things. And if you have the paper, what, what can you do with that? Print the money. Print the money. If you compare this with the private side, uh, you can try to increase your revenue. You can try to increase your rev or cut your cost, as the lady said. But the private individuals and the corporates, they don't have the luxury of printing the money. Yeah, but the bitcoins in most of the countries are now banned. That could be kind of private money. Uh, but I, I read yesterday that after China, India has also called or declared them as a, um, you know, illegitimate uh, monetary, uh, you know, money, and it's called a private money. Not, I won't say illegal, but it's a called private money. It, people, those who invest, do let them invest, but uh, you can't use it as a legal tender. You can't use it in place of money. Anyways, and if imagine that your public expenditure was not 2,000. Hey, you can do one more thing. Uh, when you borrow, yeah? How do you borrow from, let's say that you have to cover this deficit of 400. Uh, one way of covering this deficit is that you borrow from the other countries, right? Uh, then you have to give some security. Can you borrow without security? When you borrow and you go to the bank, you just go and take money from the bank. Is it so easy? You pledge something, pledge. You give some security. It's called pledge or there's another word, uh, you, we use it, um, what's the word? Collateral, collateral. Have you heard these words? Pledge or collateral. Collateral, uh, I can write down these words just in case. Uh, pledge. or co let which means you give some security. I remember, uh, uh, well, I don't want to give my own example, but anyways, uh, when you buy a house, okay, of course you buy on, on debt, you borrow money from the bank, uh, and then you sign the papers, the house deal, you know, and then you immediately give the papers to the bank and you keep paying the mortgage, and when you pay the last installment, then the bank would give your house papers to you. Hey, now you actually the owner. Of the... Earlier, you were the occupant of the house, but now you become the owner of the house as well. This is called collateral. Okay, so, but if, let's assume that your expenses are not 2000, but 1200, then do you have deficit now? This time, you have a surplus of 800. If you have surplus, let's say at the end of the month, you save 800 euros, what would you do? Sorry? Yeah, you keep in the bank, you invest, 
you do something or spend more yeah <laughs> yes that's that's possible if the state for example let's say if a state is bent upon cutting the expenses but that is affecting unfavorably the living standards of its people people are getting uh, sick and they are getting tired and they don't get enough of facilities and the state knows that they have a surplus then the state can start spending on people so you're right you can increase your spending as well or you start investing somewhere like norway has always been in surplus if you look at all the economies in eu where the europe has seen worst time but norway is, has always been in the surplus because they got so much money hmm? so this is how the things work but do you understand the whole idea here right it's not very different from the private finance basically the way we manage our kitchen grocery so uh, the same things they if you uh, if you upscale it uh, they become at the state level the the logic the argument is still the same that doesn't change except that the state has a printing press with lots of paper but use it very carefully if the state is using this printing part uh, very often then what would happen then the value of the money will go down nobody would believe your currency okay uh, we have a friend from zimbabwe uh, she knows much better that uh, there have been a situation in zimbabwe uh, when inflation was 100% on daily basis we have seen in 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 europe during uh, 1930s when the when people would bring money on horses and then they throw it in front of a shop and what they get was a piece of bread so that way uh, if there's a too much of uh, printing of money uh, state must use it with careful lot of caution uh, when they are printing more money so otherwise it would be it would have very strong backlash right we move on to the slides very quickly now uh, am i sharing this now could you see it uh, i think no now you can see uh, just a bit of theory uh, john maynard keynes or who we popularly called as lord keynes uh, was the one who propounded fiscal policy uh, in the late 19th century uh, if i'm not wrong uh, the name of his book was uh, general theory of employment interest and money it's a it's a legendary book and i think i have the pdf of this book somewhere hmm? i got in the gray market somewhere uh, this book says that the state can become can act as a stabilizer in the economy uh, by adjusting by fine tuning i think I, i told you last week that the state has two remote controls to run the economy one is monetary policy where the state has minimum um, supposedly minimum interference and it's run by the central bank of the country which is more like a technocrat people somebody who has a background in finance is running the bank but here in the fiscal policy it's more a matter of politicians it's more a matter of uh, state right uh, minister of finance in the state uh, is running the fiscal policy uh, basically so the lord keynes idea was that the state can fine tune the economy uh, whenever there is too much of expansion uh, he compared the economy like a human body and his idea was that blood and blood circulation are very important for the human body if there is less blood and less blood circulation you know the, the slow blood circulation we have to something pump in otherwise the person can die 
And how do we do it? We invest more resources, like in the economy, same way if the economy has less resources and the resources are moving slowly, uh, economy would never come out of the, 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 the brink of disaster. So we have to pump in the economy. We have to start activities, public spending. I was talking to my colleague yesterday. Uh, Lord Keynes even gave the idea of uh, he, he, his one of his phrase in the book is dig up the holes and fill it which basically means that if you want to if the economy is really slowing down create even unnecessary activities in the state employ people tell them to dig up the hole and then in the evening, tell them to fill it again and give them the wage. What would they do with that wage? They will go to a shop, they will buy food. The revenue of the food store will increase. Then this food store will employ more people at the till point and also buy more food from the supplier. And thus the recovery would start expanding. And this is called, uh, when you are expansionary, it means that you want to speed up. Uh, you want to speed up the flow of resources in the economy and you want to increase the size. So the economy is going down. You want to use uh, uh, you know, more money, more public expenditure. Uh, like we have the project in Hippos, similarly launch such projects even more, try to expand. On the other hand, if there's too much blood and too much blood pressure, uh, too much of blood circulation, that can also lead to hemorrhage. So we need to calm it down, slow it down, okay? Put more taxes on people, take extra resources. Uh, if you have the state projects, uh, you know, postpone them for some time. So try to slow down the economy by yourself. Often, when you are trying to get rid of recession, slow down, slow economy, you, you try to spend more than what you get because you want to really expand. So your spendings are more than what you earn. So usually if you want to uh, remove this, uh, you know, recession in the economy, uh, you often follow the deficit policy. Deficit. You create. You deliberately, on purpose, you have deficit because you want to expand the economy. You want to spend more than what you have. On the contrary, if the economy is already too big and too fast, uh, too much resources, and there's a fear that the economy can collapse, it's overheated economy. We need to calm it down. Then you try to spend less. So for the given revenue, spending goes down and you are in the surplus situation. Make sense? Did you get the idea? So the state use this deficit budget and the surplus budget as a tool to monitor and influence the economy up and down. Fiscal policy became extremely popular as a troubleshooter in response to the Great Depression. Uh, fiscal policy in the antithesis to the classical economy. Look, look at this uh, classical e economics. Do you remember this picture? Which I often draw that if you want to tell somebody what is capitalism, and you don't want to speak a word, just draw this picture. Demand curve, supply curve, and whenever demand supply meet, the economic decision is taken. So simple. And just in case uh, there's an imbalance, supply is more than demand, and we all know that if supply is more than demand, price goes down, automatically price will go down. And if, the price, if there's an imbalance so that demand is more than supply, like down, demand is much, supply is less, then price will go up till the equilibrium is reached. This is the classical economics. 
which say, says that the state must not have any role in the economic affairs. Let the, let the invisible demand and supply take the decisions. But now when you see, now when you see the fiscal policy, now when you see the fiscal policy, I'm talking about the government, so active government. So the fiscal policy, which is a part of the macroeconomics, the whole economy, not one person, uh, is in a way anti-thesis. That's why I use the word anti-thesis, opposite view, to the classical economics, which said, hey, the state's intervention should not take place. Let every decision be taken by the market mechanism, the price mechanism. But now I'm saying that the state is very active. Okay, so in many ways, uh, fiscal policy is an antithesis or opposite opinion to the classical economics, which says that all, all decisions would be taken up by demand and supply forces. During recession, when the economy is down, I think I mentioned already, uh, we, the, the state follows the expansionary policy. They want to expand. The recession means there is a, people are losing jobs. Uh, there's no income. Uh, the factories are closing down. A lot of things are in the shop, but nobody's buying them. Uh, nothing is happening. It's a kind of a very standstill economy. And you want to fill the new life in the economy. Then I use the example of dig up the holes and fill it. So create, expand. On the contrary, if the economy is inflationary, inflationary means over hyperactive economy, then you need to calm it down, slow it down. Okay. And then you are following the contractionary fiscal policy. Okay. Uh, expansionary policy, contractionary policy, we also use stimulus word for expansionary because you want to create stimulate, you want to stimulate the economy. You want to expand it. And contractionary means you are very conservative. You are cutting down expenditures. You know, you're not making fresh employments. For example, somebody can complain, hey, in, um, in, the, in, the, in the hospital in the last five years, not a single new nurse has been appointed. Uh, and then the answer is that the state is following the contractionary policy because the state doesn't want to spend more money because spending has already been too much in the economy. Usually, uh, if I draw uh, expansion and contraction together, if you look at the history of last 100 years, if I take time here, If I look for the last 100 or even more than 100 year, you will find that the economy has been like this, the ups and downs have been going like this in the, so after every 10 years, there is some global economic problem. I mean, if you look at the history, you will see that after every 10 years or so, there is an economic cycle. When economy is overly inflationary or the economy is overly recessionary. Yeah. If you want to solve this problem when the economy is overheated, then you are following conservatism, contractionary policy to calm it down. Yeah. But if you are in this, if you're struggling with recession, economy is slowing down, then you have to follow more expansionary policy as a stimulus to, 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 you know, to push the economy up. But if you look at this picture, this, this is not a very good graphic, of course not, but do you notice something here? Any observation when you see this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to bring to your attention this thing. 
duration of expansionary economy and duration of recessionary economy are the same in general. Are the same or different? Different. different. Look, in general, the good time in the economy remain for less period. But the bad time, recession, remains for long period. Any reason for it? Any reason for it? The reason is that when there's a bad time, you're struggling with a bad time, really bad time, then you cannot just recover it with the expansionary fiscal policy because people, businesses, they are psychologically so depressed that it's very difficult to bring them back to the normal pace. Technically, you can bring them by monetary policy, by fiscal policy, you can do something very, very, you know, something to, to bring the economy back on the track. But when there's a bad time, recession time, then people are, have lost hopes. Businesses, even you offer them loan at negative interest, even if you give them subsidies, even if you tell them that, hey, next five years, no taxes, they would be still very skeptic to invest because they're so much depressed. They, they see no future. So it takes time for them to come out of their shell and behave normally. Until early 90s, Japan was growing at supersonic speed. And then since early 90s, I would say Japan, Japanese economy went down. Till date, till date, they have not been able to break this shackle. They haven't been able to break. And how many years have gone now? Almost 30 years. One way or other, the shades of recession. At that time, there was a big, you know, kind of thing that if, if Japan continues the way we, I was young that time, and we were, uh, Japan has always been a very good example for me as a nation, national character. Uh, and there was a there was a very strong opinion that if Japan keeps growing at the same pace, it would outstrip USA in in no time. And then suddenly, the Japanese economy collapsed. Till date, they haven't been able to break this jinx. Make sense? So that's why the recessionary uh, phase, the bad time lasts long because you cannot recover it. And guess what? In Japan, in the, in the world, when people all over the world first time came to know that the interest rate can be negative. Japan was doing it already for the last 20 years. So even if the interest rate is negative, even the state is giving you all types of uh, bounties, all types of concessions, uh, people are not willing to spend because they are psychologically so much shattered, they don't want to take any initiative. So that's why, uh, even though this drawing doesn't look good, but I on purpose uh, made this phase uh, broader, wider than this one. Hmm? And these, uh, you know, zigzags often comes at an, I mean, you can see in the last history and um, some years, uh, on an average, uh, this happens after every 10 years. So this is how, uh, now I want, to, I want to talk about the inflation a little bit. I don't know if you remember, but of course I remember that last time when I showed you the central banks of Finland's website, one of the clear word that they mentioned that we want to control inflation. One of the very important objective of the monetary policy is to control inflation. And when I would show you Ministry of Finance website soon, 
You will also see on the first page that one of the important objective of the fiscal policy of Finland is to check the inflation. Because inflation is so, once it start, it remains in control somewhat, but once it break the boundary, uh, it's like tsunami, you can't control it. It's whatever you do would backfire. So that's why it's very important for all the economies to, to keep an eye on inflation. Anyways, by inflation, uh, let's have a short quiz actually. What do you mean by inflation? I know none of you is hearing this word first time. <laughs> but I want somebody to, to say something about inflation. And people in chat can also answer, or somebody can speak out. If you have the access to Zoom, that would be even better because then uh, our friends in Zoom can, uh, can also hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm here now. Uh, inflation is uh, when money loses their valuability, mm -hmm. right? And I also have a question uh, about inflation. Uh, am I right that inflation may speed up the process of distrib distribution of importance and needs of society? Mm -hmm. For example, uh, it shows which jobs uh, are needed now. Okay. Well, you went to the dynamics of inflation, but um, try to remember what he said. Okay. I'll come back to it. But at the moment, I, wa I want to know. I, I agree with you the first part of your reply mm -hmm. that inflation is about the money is losing the value economy and why money is losing the value because we are printing too much money people have tons and tons of money like the same example that during the hyperinflation time in the 1930s people were carrying money on maybe on the horses <laughs> you know there's so many movies which show mm -hmm. and all they're getting is a piece of bread so there's too much money but too few goods it's because we are printing more money so it's inflation uh, means and the price goes up the money income loses the value. Imagine you are earning thousand euros per month now, you earn thousand euros next month also, but the prices of everything goes up by 10%. What will happen? Your purchasing capacity will go down by 10%, even though your monetary income is still the same. Your nominal income is thousand, still thousand, but your real income means your buying power has gone down. You get my point? Yeah. Uh, inflation is substantial increase in the price over a long, over a wide range of goods and services and for a fairly long period of time. Do you get my point? Yeah, I mean, wide means a lot of. If, for example, I give you give you an example. Let's say that all the milk we consume in U.S. Kula is coming from Tampere. Let's say this value and all these uh, companies, none of them is in U.S. Kula. Let's assume it's, it's in Tampere. And over a certain period of time, let's say over three to four days, there's so much snow, unprecedented snow, that all the lorries which bring milk from Tampere to Uvascula, they don't show up. And there's no state control over the milk prices in, in here. And what happened is to the demand suddenly, demand is still the same, but the supply of milk has gone down. There's no, no fresh milk coming. As a result, 
the price of milk may go up. And even though it's a bad example, because in Finland, you have you can't increase the prices of consumer goods, the, the necessities so quickly. But let's assume that uh, we live in Tampere and Uvascula are in USA and there's no state control, okay? The price of milk will go up. How much? Let's say 10%, 5%, 6%. Look, only price of milk has increased. It has increased by a very narrow margin, maybe 2%, 3%. And this will last only for three days. After three, four days, they are working on cleaning the road, the fresh delivery, or it will come through Pieximaki or some other route, whatever. This cannot be called inflation because it's for one or few products, small range of increase, and only for a few days, very short period. Inflation is the opposite. Substantial increase, if not all the products, but at least most of the products and services, and it stays for a long period. That is called inflation. So exactly opposite to this milk example is inflation. You can say that milk price have increased, but you can't say that there is inflation in US Kula. And moreover, inflation doesn't happen in one particular city or a region. It's much wider territory, maybe global inflation sometimes. Look at the world war. Uh, if, you, if you dig up the reasons of both world wars, you will find inflation. To, in the beginning of war and after the war, was that inflation restricted to one country? It went to almost entire globe. So even the geographical territory of inflation is very wide. Okay? Now, in my opinion, inflation can be good and bad both. Harmless inflation, I shouldn't say good or bad, I should say harmless inflation and harmful inflation. Have a look at this picture. Have a look at this, only look at this picture. There is supply curve and there's a demand curve. Yeah, can you see that? Do you agree that demand curve and supply curves are like this? Downward sloping, demand curve, upward sloping supply curve, yeah? But if you look, I put a new uh, abbreviation A in front, AD, and AS, A stands for aggregate, aggregate, total, demand, total demand, because now we talk about the whole economy. AS, the total supply, aggregate supply. This is the equilibrium. Look at the blue line, AD1 and AS, equilibrium. This is the price, and this is the quantity. Now what happens? There's a pressure of demand. Demand is going up, substantially huge. And as a result, your demand curve shifts up AD1 to, from AD1 to AD2. And the new equilibrium is here. And the price have gone up from OP1 to OP2. It's the inflation, yeah? It's an inflation. Do you agree with me? Price goes up at the aggregate level, at the macro level. Price goes up, you agree? Bad thing? Obviously bad thing, but what is a good thing? Can you see some good, good thing in this picture? Sorry? The good thing is that the national output has also increased from OQ1 to OQ2. People have, even though price is going up, living standards have gone up. I mean, the living expenses have gone up, but people are getting more jobs. People are in producing more. The country is expanding. Economy is expanding. I don't mind paying more price on my living expenses if I have a good job and I'm, in, I'm getting success in my life. 
You with me? So this is called a relatively good inflation. The price goes up, but so is the national output, the GDP, national income. Look at this picture. And the, by the way, this is called demand pull inflation because this is caused by uh, expansion in demand. Have a look at this picture. Aggregate demand curve is the blue line. Aggregate supply curve AS1 is also the blue line. The equilibrium is here. In the market, OP1 is the price. The national output is OQ1. But then comes a problem. The problem is that the cost of production has gone up. This time, here, 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 disruption was caused by increase in demand by people. But here, the disruption is caused by the companies because the cost is going up. Wage have gone up, interest have gone up, taxes have gone up. So the cost of production has gone up. And remember, your aggregate supply curve shows what? Your cost. As the aggregate supply curve goes up, it means that the cost has gone up. So what happened? The same thing, now you have to sell for a more price. And then your aggregate supply curve becomes AS2. Because of more cost, you want more price to remain sustainable, to remain in the business. And now the equilibrium is here. The price have gone up. Earlier, it was OP1, now it's OP2, the price went up. But is it the only trouble we have? Price went up, we all are sad, we all are upset, we all are angry. But is it the only problem we are facing? What else problem you see? Huh? The GDP of the country has also gone down. It has gone down, isn't it? So on the one hand, when I say GDP gone down at the practical term, I, I, on the one hand, the food item has become expensive and on the other hand, people don't have job. So on the one hand, people are becoming unemployed. On the other hand, the food is becoming expensive. This is what is shown by second picture. In the first picture, the food is becoming expensive, but you are getting more jobs. Nobody's getting unemployed. People, companies are looking for people. Hey, come, we are recruiting, join us. At least there's some consolation that people are getting jobs even though the prices are going up. But here on the one, it's, it's called double whammy, you know, two-edged sword. On the one hand, the price goes up. And on the second hand, people are losing jobs. And one more word, and we call it cost push inflation because the disturbance, disruption is caused not by demand, but by supply. And this phenomenon, cost push inflation, uh, this is also called, there's a phrase I just remembered before I forget it, I want to share with you. And that phrase is called, uh, that phrase is called, maybe it's in the slide somewhere, I remember. This phrase is called stagflation. Stagflation is when on the one hand, we have inflation, but at the same time, we also have unemployment. So it's double whammy, it's two, two bad things happening together. Make sense? Stagflation, it's a very bad thing. You are not having one evil, but you have two evils together.
And this is the other name of, you can call it, what's the word? Cost push inflation. This is very dangerous inflation. And actually, uh, when you see, when I see it more uh, minutely, when I see it more minutely, this good inflation at some stage would become bad inflation. How? Remember the example I was giving you that on the one hand, the food prices are getting more expensive in the store but people are getting jobs. When companies are pleading workers, hey, come, we want to give you a job. What will happen? The wage will go up. Wage will go up. Uh, the total wage expenditure of the companies will increase. The rents will go up. Because companies are expanding, they have to spend more money on uh, interest on buying the property and all that. So basically things will become expensive. And when your inputs become expensive, your cost increase. And how does the cost increase reflect? The aggregate supply curve goes up. So whenever you are encountering demand pull inflation, don't celebrate. Consider yourself fortunate that you have some got time, you have got time to do something seriously good so that you don't move from this picture to this picture. So when you experience this inflation, it's a red flag, it's a warning signal, but don't celebrate, hey, at least we are having jobs, but it won't stay very long. So as a good finance minister, as a good, economic planner, when you are in this situation, think carefully that it will not take ages before you switch over here. And once you're here, the point of return can come after many, many, many years and all the distribution and redistribution that you've done. Now remember this gentleman's point, inflation makes the gap between rich and poor even wider. You can spend decades and decades in bringing equality, equity, you know, all the good example I was giving you, one spell of inflation, one year, two years, and it would create the gaps of income and wealth once again. So you are back, whatever you have achieved in the last 30 years, um, you can lose in six months. So that's why treat inflation very seriously. Uh, I don't think I need to explain it because I have done a lot of explanation. But the last thing in this topic I want to, or maybe the second last thing I want to explain it to you, that when the company, uh, not the company, why well, I company, when an economy have lots of reserve resources, reserve resources means what? You have still unutilized land. You have still unutilized labor capital. So you are resource surplus. Then the supply curve can be fully elastic. You can see the aggregate supply curve is parallel to Y X axis, yeah? It means what? It means that your production system is so flexible you want to produce more, you can produce more immediately. You want to produce less, you can produce less, no problem. And here, if the demand increases or decreases, guess what happens? There is a change in the supply. There's a change in the quantity immediately. And what happens? The price doesn't rise at all. So the supply system is so elastic that the price is not at all, not at all changing. Example, even though it was not a good example about milk, 
uh, in the uvascular and there is a lot of snow and milk is not coming. Supply of milk is so flexible that even if the demand increases, immediately, if, if milk doesn't come from Tampere, it comes from elsewhere, immediately. And if there's a decrease in the demand of milk, no problem, it, it's paved, stored immediately. This is this situation. Your supply is so flexible, it's so elastic, that whatever disruption is caused by demand, your price do not change. And then we have another extreme example, another extreme example. In real life, it's almost impossible to have such a flexible supply system. And then we have another extreme system where your aggregate supply curve is fully inelastic. You have what you have, neither less nor more. Sometimes we say we go to store and we want to buy something. We want to buy some chicken. And when we, bend, we, when we go to the shelf of chicken, uh, there's no chicken. And we ask those people, uh, could you, uh, you know, uh, can you bring some more from the store? You know, the, your, uh, what is a storage uh, where you have this fridge there? They say, no, it's over. It is what it is. Take or leave. This is called inelastic supply curve. Here, if demand increases from 81 to 82, there is an immediate increase in the price. And if there is a decrease in demand, there's an immediate instant decrease in the price, but supply doesn't change at all. So only thing change, the only variable thing is price, quantity is constant here. The only variable thing is quantity. Price will always be constant. These two are extreme situations. In the real life, in the real life, we often see that supply curve is neither so elastic nor so inelastic. Supply curve is in between them, in between these two extreme uh, examples. Supply curve is like this, and this is a demand curve. And if demand increases, the price increases, but there is also increase in the national output. But don't take this. You should be happy. You should feel yourself uh, fortunate that uh, you have got some time to make adjustments. It's a wake up call, okay? Uh, don't take the situation as a matter of uh, jubilation, happiness, because then you can go in this curve, this side. So, so basically this is a warning signal. Take it as a caution. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is about the fiscal policy. And very quickly, uh, I want everybody, I want everybody to open this link, uh, vm.free, uh, which is basically the Ministry of Finance of Finland. Uh, I have opened this window already, so I can share it with you. Uh, where is that, by the way? Now I can show it to you. Please read this out. Uh, by yourself and try to uh, read the, the this is a, just in case, this is the Ministry of Finance website. And we, I, I took that URL where we have the fiscal policy. Uh, please read it by yourself. And please tell me the points where you can relate this text with today's lesson. Or if the text is saying something else, then please let me know that also. But from my side, uh, this lesson is over. So now we all have self studies about fiscal policy. And if you find something difficult, please let me know. Uh, but I'm not uh, closing the Zoom recording yet because we also need to discuss the, you know, the other issues as well. But I'm pausing it.
All right, so for some time now, we need to uh, focus on this fiscal policy of Ministry of Finance Finland and see that uh, what are their uh, core objectives of fiscal policy and what kind of uh, mechanism of fiscal policy they have been using or they plan to use. Remember, the choice of fiscal policy depends on, to a large extent, the kind of uh, the government you have, what type of uh, political party is, is in the center. As I said, that Ministry of Finance, sorry, 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 sorry. The monetary policy is more in the hands of uh, a professional, regardless of the politician. I remember there was a, uh, in the US, we have this Federal Reserve System, um, which is equal to the central bank of the country even though they have many banks, many central banks in the US, uh, the Federal Reserve System, the, the governor of the Fed, the Federal Reserve was Ben Bernanke. And he was the president, he was the governor of the Federal Reserve System for over 30 years, over 30 years. No, 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 sorry, I'm wrong. Not Ben Bernanke, it was Alan Greenspan. Ben Bernanke came afterwards, my apologies. Not Ben, but Alan Greenspan was the head of the Federal Reserve Bank banking system of the USA for over 30 years. And when he retired, he almost pleaded to the state that, hey, let me die in peace. I mean, I'm too old to run. I mean, and whether they were Republicans or Democrats, they all were so happy. Uh, and he was following his own policies. So the state was not as intrusive, uh, where, but in the fiscal policy, the, the government, the political philosophy affiliations, uh, they are more obvious. You get the point? Because fiscal policy is run by the minister and the monetary policy is run by the professional technocrat. Even though usually the Minister of Finance is also somebody who have a background in the field of economics and finance, but still it's more a political thing rather than the, yeah. Right, so I let you speak now. Fiscal policy, please. Your observations about Finnish fiscal policy. I keep it on anonymous. Okay, go ahead. I will read out what you, I'll speak out what you say. So that's a very good point you raised. Uh, fiscal policy is, of course, is a part of the government's economic policy. You can see uh, the, where the money comes from, how to allocate the funds, the government programs, taxation, social security, pensions, um, and all these uh, economic structures, expansion, contraction, uh, accordingly shape opportunities for the citizens in terms of employment, 
household, businesses, uh, fiscal policy decisions are there for part of the social structure. So if you want to structure, restructure the economy, uh, like distribution, redistribution, uh, then fiscal policy is used very, uh, very important instrument in the hands of state to control and, uh, you know, influence the economy. The fiscal policy is largely influenced by the state. Uh, these are the uh, guidelines of the prime minister. Uh, given normal economic circumstances, the, they want to be in balance in 23. So what is balance? Remember, we talk about deficit and surplus. And balance is that when your inflow and outflow is nearly matching. So Finnish budget is in deficit every year, but they have a wish that by 23, uh, it should be in the balance or at least close to the balance. It means you need to raise your inflow and kind of watch your outflow. You know, <laughs> there should be difference. There should be some balance between spending uh, and the earning. And yes. Why is it that they put that they want to get the employment up to 75%? I think it's about 73. There's a problem that tries to open internet. So mm -hmm. more people work, then they can... So the Finnish government, you're, you're, you're right, the Finnish government want to expand uh, employment to 75%. So from 73, you said, Tanya? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so it means that, yeah. So you want to make it, and how can you create uh, employment, uh, more employment? Would you be expansionary, uh, stimulus oriented, or would you be, uh, would you be uh, contractionary, uh, Contractionary, uh, what's the word? Come on, I'm losing. Uh, conservative way. If you have to increase, if uh, Sana Marin's government want to increase employment, would you be having expansionary policy or the contractionary policy? Hmm? Expansionary. Obviously expansionary. You create more you know, jobs. But then it could be possible that it conflicts with this thing. Because when you want to expand, it means your expenses would go up. And it could be possible that you find a trade-off that do you want to have a balance between the cash inflow and cash outflow? Or do you want to tolerate deficit, but you want to enhance employment? So you can see, Two objectives may conflict. I'm not saying they are conflicting, but they may conflict. The higher employment rate is the most important. Yes, it's very important to give jobs to people so that uh, jobs not only give you uh, money, but it, it also give self-esteem and you feel yourself as a productive contributor in the society. So it's not just of course, money is also important, but it also makes you feel good about yourself. Uh, uh, so uh, the governments, uh, by decisions of the government, the permanent general government expenditure, remember we talk about the public expenditure, the same thing here, uh, at a level of 23 will be Euro 1.3 billion higher than in spring. So there would be, the government admits that in comparison to 19 in 23, uh, the spending would be 1.3 billion larger. So it's not total spending, but they would increase by 1.3 billion euros. Uh, is there anything else I need to observe? Um, Tax revenue will be increased by, uh, you know, 700 million, 0 0.7 billion. Um, on budget revenue expenditure will be reallocated, redistribution we're talking, talking about. Uh, attaining this goal requires a measure that supports supply and demand of labor. That's very important that we have flexible and increased demand and supply of labor so that there's a mismatch. Remember the mismatch? This equilibrium, so the demand curve, supply curve match. 
that mismatch should be avoided. No disequilibrium. So when you, when you read sentence by sentence, you start linking it with the concepts. Uh, one half of the measures must be completed by the time the government budget session. So in 2020, well, it's already, in, I think it's written before, uh, they, want to, they don't want to achieve all their objective in 23, but they want that half of them should be already achieved by August 2020. So I think in the next white paper, which be, if you go to uh, the same websites and there's a call, there's a link called publications. In the publications, you may see in the time to come if state has achieved what they wanted by now or not. Uh, deficit fulfills the, okay. Uh, the state of Finland has uh, a deficit equal to uh, half a percentage of total GDP. Okay. So for example, if I say, uh, uh, that the total GDP is 1,000 euros and you have a deficit of 100 euros, that is 10%. Yeah, and 10 euro deficit would be 1% and 5 euro deficit should be, would be 0.5%. Do you get my point? It means that if the state of Finland is spending 1,000 euros it must get back how much? Uh, 950 revenue. So the maximum deficit should be 50. And in percentage, it, it becomes half a percentage. And even though it's a state thing, but still Finland is part of EU and it, it also have to, the Finnish fiscal policy has to gel with the EU fiscal policy. And up to 0.5% of deficit is okay, permissible as per the EU guidelines. So this is not a very serious problem. So even though the state of Finland is having deficit in the budget, but it's not, you know, nothing serious. And this is the, you can see that the budget, uh, the, the debt of the state, and you can see that it used to be about 20 billion uh, euros in, well, at that time, if you convert um, uh, the, the Finnish currency then in 80s, and it has went up, but then it went down in the early part of this century. And now it's rising um, more or less every year, basically. So, and then there is, a, it, even though when the debt was going down, suddenly came uh, COVID-19, and then you can see that the state spending has to suddenly go up because of this. But now it's still more or less, it's not, it's not too bad. Okay. So this is everything about the fiscal policy. And if you want to know more, feel free. Um, we'll be very happy to answer you. And uh, if any questions about any topic, any concept uh, for the remaining time, please ask. And uh, now I stop recording. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, let them pop up. Uh, I would only resume the recording if there is a question which the answer may be beneficial to everybody. Yep. Uh, this morning I was watching the news and I was just wondering, could you like explain it to me better? What is happening right now in Turkey? Is the Turkish leader going down? Mm -hmm. President Erdogan is doing something stupid mm -hmm. with it, like some interest. It's recorded. It's recorded. And you know that uh, I came to know a very important point, a very important point. That's the problem sometimes that even though economics is a very important field uh, of our nations or global community, uh, still sometimes the politics overrides the economics. People who make decisions, uh, the political leaders, uh, they sometimes don't even care about the economic rationale. And if you are, if you want to become, if, imagine you are a, somebody is a state leader, okay? And now the elections are coming up in one year. 
six months, what he would do, he would try to guarantee his votes and he would show himself or herself as very generous politician, spending, make people happy, start developmental project. What will happen? Expenditures will go up. You don't care about, and in fact, sometimes you deliberately make economy worse. If you are ahead of the state who knows that in the given situation, you will never become, you never win the election next time. So you don't want to inherit the good economy to the next government. Sometimes you do on purpose. Yes, I I am very sorry to admit it that sometimes many uh, politicians they because of their myopic view, because of their short term horizon, or they want to win back. And in the six months, in one year, there's nothing much they can do. They only want to woo, attract people by behaving like a emperor or behaving like a king or whatever you call monarch, you know, keep spending, try to woo people, but they don't know that eventually you, the, the deficit will increase. But does it mean that now there's going to be inflation? I'm, com I'm coming on that point. Now, when this deficit happens, you can't let it go. You have to fill the deficit. How do you fill the deficit? You borrow more. IMF say, no, no more borrowing to you. You have already borrowed too much. Then you start borrowing from here and there at high cost or even printing more money. Then comes the inflationary impact in the economy. And when this inflation comes, your currency loses the value. As a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, this is a very important point you raised. If the economy, if the inflation is 5%, yeah? and your economy is growing at 2%. How much? 2%. There's a gap of 3%. Your currency will go down by 3%. But if, like, like for example, the example you cited that if, the, if politician keeps spending, spending, the deficit is going up, more deficit means more money supply, more printing, more inflation, output is not rising, the gap between inflation and the GDP is going up, this gap would reflect on your exchange rate. On the other hand, if the inflation is 2% and GDP is growing at 5%, the good gap, this time the gap is good because inflation is two, GDP is five the good gap is 3%, your currency would increase value 3% against others. Is it this why they have made the new money yet? Yeah. Yeah. Or short-term borrowing. Yeah. yeah. But this is not good because on the one hand, you are creating the economy, you're making pushing the economy to a disaster. Uh, if you come back in the power or if somebody else comes back in the power, you really have to struggle. So, okay, it can be, you, have, you may have revenge, taken the revenge on your opponents, but you are harming the country. Number two, no foreign investor would invest if your domestic currency's value is going down yeah. and high inflation. Okay. And then because of this high inflation and poor value, uh, I don't think, um, and because of the going value of the currency, the imports become expensive. So people, those very essential imports, which a country wants, the country has to pay more money because, so it's a, it's a very bad thing to do. But the problem is that, again, that when the politicians, they are meddling into economics, this would happen. And not only in this one country, but this is a global problem all over the world. Good point. Good, good, good point, good point. And I think uh, now I'm recording it. And the point you raised was actually about this. 
this point, whiteboard. Uh, do I go to the previous one? Oh, yeah, this one actually. You were talking about that. Is it a global thing? Yeah. Well, in general, it's a global thing, but there can be exception. Some exception, or in some countries, the height of this peak could be small or even larger, and and the depth can also be uh, deep or lesser, or the width of this bad time recession can be even longer. Like Japan, still there, many people. Uh, many countries broke this stretch. Japan has not been able to do it yet. Okay, right? Uh, and there can also be some exception that when the whole world is going down, some economies are making progress. Like for example, when we say um, 2008 crisis, um, some Southeast Asian countries were making money during that time because they're so efficient. Like when all other ports are losing out, Singapore was gaining because of the efficiency, because of the speed. Even the Australian uh, exporters, they were getting their shipments from the Singaporean ports. So they were gaining. And overall, during the recession time, this 2008, um, I would say that oceanic part, like if you go, you know, the South, uh, Southeast Asia, um, and then including Australia and New Zealand, they, they were quite, I won't say that they were really in growing in double digit, uh, but they didn't do any much worse comparison to the other countries. Asian countries were doing fine, all right, at least, at least okay. Um, but Europe was really reeling in the recession and so was the US. North America, I would say. But many Asian countries were doing quite a good job. Uh, all these Western Asian countries, the Gulf countries, were doing all right kind of business. Uh, India, China, go down, and then Australia. When you say that when we were in the recession, they, their recession was another moment. Yeah, as I said, that the, yeah, the height and the breadth, uh, the width can vary. But this is the overall trend, the general trend at the global level, at the, yeah. So um, once again, um, maybe uh, if you want to have another such session or if you want to throw some terms and phrases and you want more one-to-one -one discussion, uh, feel free to give your this demand in the discussion forum. Um, my colleagues will, would keep track. And once we found significant, substantial, visible demand, uh, then maybe I can organize one more session with you. Yeah, when? I don't know, but we can do something. Yeah, uh, obviously I would be organizing it between the time 8th and 15th. Because I want you to focus on your presentation on 1st and 8th, yeah? 